How secure is the world from nuclear weapons, given the spread of atomic arsenals from America to Europe and Asia? To answer that question, I have with me Mark Fitzpatrick of the International Institute of Strategic Studies, Americas. He's a specialist in uh, nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. Uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick, uh, how secure is the world from atomic arsenals? It's a dangerous world. There are 15,000 nuclear weapons today, each one of which could destroy a city. They're in the hands of nine countries. Now, the good news is that there are not 10 nuclear armed states. There was a very significant positive development a year and a half ago when Iran agreed to limit its nuclear program. It didn't have nuclear weapons, and now it's impossible for it to get nuclear weapons. Uh, nine nuclear armed states is still nine too many. 15,000 nuclear weapons is 15,000 too many. Um, they're not being reduced as rapidly as they were uh, 10 years ago. There's still some slight reductions, though. Um, but whether uh, the world will be safer in the upcoming years, I don't know. So you don't believe disarmament is something which the U.S. or Russia, for that matter, will be prepared to initiate? No, I don't see much uh, initiative. I don't see any initiative uh, on the part of Russia to promote disarmament. The previous U.S. president, Barack Obama, uh, talked a good game about um, a nuclear weapons-free world, but his policies didn't actually move uh, too close uh, toward that goal. The current U.S. President, Donald Trump, doesn't talk about disarmament as well. So I think for the next few years, uh, at best, if we can maintain the arms control agreements that we have, uh, that may be the best we can do. You mentioned Obama did a game with nuclear weapons. Um, I don't understand. Did he pretend that he was in favor of disarmament but actually did nothing? I didn't mean to say that he was pretending. I said he talked a good game. His rhetoric was good. He uh, enunciated a goal, and the goal was motivational. But his actual policies uh, did not meet the goal. This was in part because he didn't have partners who supported the goal. In Congress, um, most of uh, at the time, the Congress was led by Republicans who didn't support the goal of disarmament. He didn't have a partner in um, Vladimir Putin who was interested in further nuclear cuts. And he faced countries such as uh, Pakistan that uh, stymied his efforts to uh, reduce the nuclear dangers around the world. Within the American establishment, is there a sense that um, uh, the time has come now to slowly move towards uh, disarmament, or is that something which they'd rather not touch? I think within the establishment, if you're talking about um, the leaders of Congress and uh, the leaders of industry, uh, the, the leaders in the bureaucracy, most of them are pretty cynical about the uh, disarmament goal. Uh, they believe that United States uh, nuclear weapons are protecting the United States, and they have a good reason to believe that. But the, what they don't uh, quite grasp is that nuclear weapons are inherently dangerous and that we've been lucky that there haven't been more accidents, more mishaps, more misperceptions that could have led to war. There were many near misses during the Cold War when the United States could have come to nuclear blows with the uh, adversary, the Soviet Union. We didn't because of luck, and someday that luck could run out. What about the American public? Does it concern them that to have so many uh, atomic weapons on their soil? You know, if you asked uh, uh, people individually, I think most of them would worry about having uh, nuclear weapons. They would worry about the risks. Uh, those who live near nuclear um, facilities uh, also would worry. But by and large, they also do uh, accept that nuclear weapons have helped protect the United States. There's a belief that this system of mutual assured destruction, MAD, mutual assured destruction, has kept the United States and the Soviet Union, now Russia, from going to war directly against each other because they held off each other. But there were various other proxy wars uh, during the period of the Cold War, and as I say, there were many near misses. Mr. Fitzpatrick, um, the IASS has done a fair amount of research on this region, and uh, we have two big atomic states here, including China and number three. Uh, what is the state of uh, the um, uh, how do you define the nuclear uh, dynamic here? I would say that uh, in South Asia, there's a kind of slow-moving uh, nuclear arms race. Uh, India is competing to try to keep up with China. Pakistan is competing to try to keep up with India. Both India and 
uh, Pakistan are introducing new nuclear delivery systems that uh, uh, each sees as a kind of competition to gain an upper hand. As I say, most of the time India is looking toward China. And this introduction of new systems and a slow increase in the number of nuclear weapons makes South Asia, if not a nuclear tinderbox, at least one of the areas in the world where if there is to be a nuclear war, this might be the place that it happens. No, we have read a lot about this, you know, a lot of Western strategists believe that the next nuclear war is going to be in this part of the world. Is that a realistic, is that a credible kind of a, uh, argument to make? You know, I wouldn't say that it will happen, but I would say that if there is going to be a nuclear war, there are two places in the world where it is more likely to happen. One of them is the Korean Peninsula, which I think about a lot. The other probably is South Asia. Because of the uh, nuclear arms competition, because of the asymmetric nuclear policies of the major countries, and because a conflict could start uh, based on a terrorist incident like Mumbai in 2008, which there could be escalation, which um, could lead to a nuclear war. Do you think India is trying to catch up with the Chinese? Are we building more nuclear weapons? India isn't necessarily building many more nuclear weapons. I think there's a kind of a slow increase in India's nuclear arsenal. It might be about 120 nuclear weapons today. But what India is doing is um, in increasing the range of its nuclear delivery systems to be able to uh, not just match China, but to be able to hit uh, uh, Chinese uh, facilities and territory uh, to protect uh, Indian territory to have deterrence. The um, ICBM that uh, India recently tested, is that seen as a threat in the West? I don't see India's ICBM as a threat because India has no adversaries in the West. It's you know why I don't see uh, France's nuclear uh, weapons or Britain's as a threat uh, to the United States because uh, we're on friendly terms, uh, similarly with India. But there is a dynamic uh, in South Asia when India introduces new systems, uh, Pakistan sometimes feels compelled to uh, catch up with it. And this uh, dynamic uh, could lead, in some cases, to a nuclear war. And even though that nuclear war would be between India and Pakistan, uh, having a nuclear war in South Asia would cast a cloud that would encircle the world and could lead to two billion people in the world being put at risk of starvation. So there's, a, there's an indirect threat to the rest of the world. The manner in which Pakistan has been um, building up its nuclear arsenal, uh, today it's acknowledged that uh, Pakistan's uh, growth, uh, the amount of money they're investing in their nuclear arsenal is uh, astronomical. Uh, why are they doing this? Well, first of all, I think we should probably put it in context. I'm not defending Pakistan here, but the um, Pakistan's uh, the cost of Pakistan's nuclear weapons program is probably about 10 percent of their military budget as a whole. Uh, that might be about 2.5 billion U.S. dollars. That's probably less than uh, the cost of India's nuclear arsenal. India, of course, can afford it much more than can Pakistan. And that is why Pakistan is doing it. It's a means for Pakistan to keep up with India's might. You know, in every field, economics, military spending, what have you, Pakistan lags behind India and the disparity gets worse every day. Nuclear weapons are Pakistan's way of keeping up with India so that it, uh, it, can, sense, it can feel that uh, if there's another war, it can defend itself. Do you see China encouraging Pakistan in this? I don't see China encouraging Pakistan today. Certainly they did in the past. Certainly, Pac uh, Pakistan's nuclear weapons designs uh, came from China, at least some of them. Uh, China supplied uh, some fissile material for Pakistan's program and some other uh, assistance. I don't see that assistance continuing today. China is aligned with Pakistan in many ways. China supports Pakistan's nuclear energy industry, but I don't see evidence that Pakistan is getting nuclear weapons support from China, nor do they need it today. Pakistan already has a pretty well-developed nuclear weapons program. They don't necessarily need any assistance from any other country today. But they are developing tactical nuclear weapons. This is a new development that Pakistan recently introduced short-range battlefield use systems uh, called the Nasser. It's 
you know, called a tactical nuclear weapons for all practical purposes, although it has strategic consequences. And when Pakistan introduced this several years ago, the delivery system for this uh, nuclear weapon came from China. So that is actually one way that China has been assisting Pakistan's program, although this delivery system is a, is a dual-use system, and China would say, well, they delivered it for conventional artillery. Pakistan uh, is using it for uh, nuclear weapons delivery as well. And by the way, this introduction of so-called tactical nuclear weapons is a, is a significant worrisome development because it lowers the threshold for nuclear use. You know, normally countries wouldn't use nuclear weapons unless the very essence of the country is threatened. But Pakistan's uh, position is that if uh, there's an incursion by India across the border, say uh, a cold start uh, type incursion uh, that gets 60 miles uh, inward uh, to Pakistan, then in that case they could use nuclear weapons against Indian troops. Uh, this is not something that would threaten the uh, Pakistani state. Uh, but it would threaten the Pakistani army and, as I say, lower the threshold for nuclear use. And is it your sense that there is a broad um, a consensus within Pakistan that the uh, nuclear path they have taken is the right one? There is a very strong national consensus in Pakistan that they need nuclear weapons to defend themselves. It's their way of equalizing India's might. And there's very little uh, uh, opposition within Pakistan to the national nuclear program. The couple of voices that have expressed opposition are, are kept quiet. You know, the, the, the professors who speak out against it lose their jobs. Um, it's hard in Pakistan to speak out against the program. Do you ever go to Pakistan? Do I go to Pakistan frequently, yes, and I talk about nuclear policy with them every year. And uh, what do they tell you? Well, they explain why they need nuclear weapons, and I listen to them, and I understand their motivations. They're not crazy, irrational people. They do feel that uh, they are in this competition with India, that there have been wars. Pakistan has lost uh, ma several wars. It was dismembered as a country, and they think that they need nuclear weapons uh, to preserve their status. I think they're wrong about that, but I can understand uh, their motivations. So the uh, question about uh, the safety of Pakistan's nuclear arsenal is being talked about, uh, that some terrorists could get their hands on. Is this a credible kind of fear? Is this a rational kind of thing? It's a rational fear. I mean, when you have uh, nuclear weapons in conjunction with terrorism, and there's few countries in the world that have a greater number of terrorist groups, uh, that nexus between terrorism and nuclear weapons frightens many people. Now, in Pakistan's case, I think the concern is exaggerated. Pakistani authorities understand the problem. They really do. They take great efforts to keep their nuclear arsenal safe from terrorism, more than is commonly realized. I think that Pakistan probably gives as much attention to this as any country in the world, maybe more than any other country. One could ask you know, similar questions about India. Uh, so um, I don't think that nuclear terrorism is the biggest uh, nuclear danger facing Pakistan. I think a greater danger is the potential for war uh, in which nuclear weapons are used. But I don't discount the potential for nuclear terrorism because, uh, you know, you could get uh, jihadi uh, infiltration in, um, um, in facilities, in government, in, in the military. And uh, even though there's a, a careful system to weed out uh, radicalism, it's not inconceivable that somebody could, um, you know, get in anyway and somehow um, have an internal uh, program to seize nuclear weapons. I don't rule that out, but I, I think Pakistan is taking precautions to try to prevent it. We are talking about China. Uh, do you see China playing a positive role in terms of um, bringing down the, um, you know, the nuclear fears, the um, insecurities, or do you see them stoking the embers wherever they can? Well, Pakistan like all of the nuclear armed states, is modernizing its nuclear arsenal. Um, uh, you know, just to say something positive about China's nuclear program, they have a policy of uh, minimum deterrence. They don't feel the need to keep up with the huge numbers of nuclear weapons that the United States and Russia have. You know, each of them have about 7,000 nuclear weapons. China's nuclear arsenal is about 260, so far less. But it is modernizing. Uh, China is having, getting more of an ability to be able to hit the United States. They have probably 50 
uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles that could hit the United States. There probably is a, a kind of a mutual vulnerability between China and the United States. A mutual vulnerability uh, can be stabilizing if each uh, knows that the other can uh, destroy it. But it could also give China uh, a sense that their nuclear weapons protect them uh, and allow them to carry out more aggressive uh, conventional uh, behavior. So you see South China, in the South China Seas, uh, China behaving very aggressively, uh, building new islands, uh, pushing smaller states around. And some people say this is because uh, China feels protected by its nuclear arsenal. Do you see them, um, do you see an actual confrontation, a nuclear confrontation of some kind with America? You had various scenarios that are projected. I, I, could, I could draw you, you know, several different scenarios where China and the United States could come to nuclear blows. I don't think any of them will happen, um, but you know, there's a very small chance uh, that an escalation, say over the South China Seas or over the, dis the uh, islands that uh, Japan controls, the Senkaku, uh, China calls them Diaoyu Islands, that, that could, uh, there be a, could be a conflict there in which uh, U.S. nuclear weapons uh, could play a role. I, it, it's a bit of an exaggerated scenario, but um, as long as there are nuclear weapons and they're in the hands of humans, and humans are fallible, we make mistakes, we, we misperceive, we get wrong signals, and uh, these wrong signals could lead to a nuclear exchange, even between the United States and China. And China and North Korea, how do you describe, how do you do define that? Uh that relationship. You know, the North Korea presents uh, probably the world's biggest problem, and it's getting worse every day. You know, I thought it was pretty bad, and then you wake up and you find out that the North Korean leader has assassinated his older brother yeah. with a chemical weapon in a crowded international airport. So it's a big problem. Now, China didn't give North Korea its nuclear weapons. Um, Actually, North Korea started with a with a civil nuclear energy technology provided by the Soviet Union, and then built a, a nuclear weapons program out of it. But Chinese firms have supplied some of the wherewithal for the program, particularly uh, some of the the parts of the the missile system. So China uh, is uh, culpable in assistance uh, to North Korea, and China has been protecting uh, North Korea. China wants to keep North Korea as a buffer state. Uh, plus, China doesn't want to put enough pressure on North Korea that could possibly cause a collapse of the system and millions of North Koreans fleeing to China uh, for refuge and creating instability in one of China's border areas. So, so you know, we all look to China and say, if only China would use, would use its leverage. They supply most of the food aid, most of the um, trade, most of the investment in North Korea. If they would just use this leverage, they could put pressure on North Korea. China is not going to do that. So. Um, I think the United States shouldn't, uh, you know, shouldn't try to uh, get China to do uh, its work for it. The United States is going to have to find some ways of, of dealing with North Korea in concert with its South Korean and Japanese partners. So you're basically telling me that North Korea is developing its nuclear weapons more or less on its own? Yes, yes. And by the way, it's a very impoverished country. So a country that wants to build nuclear weapons, you know, like, like a foreign, foreign, former uh, Pakistani foreign minister and then Prime Minister um, Zulfika Ali Bhutto once said, if we have to eat grass, we will do so if we get nuclear weapons. Well, the North Koreans have a kind of similar attitude that uh, nuclear weapons they think are what protects their regime. I think they're wrong about that. Nobody's trying to topple their regime. But uh, if they think that's what they think they need to do to protect themselves, they're, they're going to keep up with their nuclear weapons. So could they start a nuclear war of some kind? Could they? Here's the scenario that I worry about in North Korea starts with a provocation like in 2010 when uh, North Korea sank a South Korean ship and then shelled a South Korean island. Well, this time South Korea responds with proportional force or even more force against the command center in North Korea. Then it's North Korea's play. How do they respond? They respond with even more force to South Korea, maybe shelling some civilian um, areas along the demilitarized zone. And then re South Korea responds in kind again, and that response is so strong that North Korea fears that it's the beginning of an invasion. Now, if they think they're being invaded, uh, nuclear weapons are their way of repelling the invasion. So I could see North Korea using a nuclear weapon under such a circumstance where they misperceive what's happening in South Korea, 
And, uh, you know, they think they're being totally rational and using nuclear weapons for de defense that they don't really need to use. And suddenly we have a nuclear war. Dangerous. You don't expect something of this kind to happen on, say, over Ukraine or something between the U.S. and Russia? You know, United States and Russia have been at loggerheads for so long, um, and we found ways to, uh, uh, through hotlines and so forth, to get over um, temporary flare-ups. But I don't put that out of the question either, because, as I say, there have been um, mishaps during the Cold War. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, there was a near nuclear exchange because when U.S. ships were dropping depth charges to try to force uh, Soviet submarines to the surface, the Soviet, one of the Soviet submarines thought that these depth charges were actual attacks against the submarine and they readied a nuclear torpedo uh, to be used. And to use a nuclear torpedo required the approval of all three of the top officers on the ship. Two of them said yes and the third one said no, let's wait. Well, that guy saved the world from a nuclear war. And, you know, circumstances could happen today. Uh, over the Ukraine uh, crisis, President Putin said that Russia was readying nuclear weapons over Crimea. I mean, why on earth would they need to do that? They don't. Uh, Russia sees nuclear weapons as its way of maintaining superpower status. I don't think they would be so stupid, so foolish as to use nuclear weapons in a crisis, but you just don't know what might happen in the fog of a crisis. On that note, Mr. Fitzpatrick, thank you very much for appearing on Straight Talk. Very happy to talk with you. Very good questions. Thank you.